Hi there, it's Marcus here again. Week eight already. And another really interesting reading for us to wrestle with. I, it's not so much wrestling, I guess, as to really think about the way method can support practice. That's really what it's all about. Uh, I don't know, about six or seven years ago, I came across Bart Ehrman, who has written a fantastic book, How Jesus Became God. He's written a number of really good books, actually. He's a biblical scholar and, you know, is really sincere historian, working with material which he considers to be historical, as opposed to material that many would hold as sacred, God-given, um, true beyond the kind of cognitive uh, intellectualizations of materialists, historians, secularists, whatever you want to call it. Now, I happen to have a number of Bart Ehrman's uh, lectures and talks as well. Um, and, you know, he's not a secularist in the traditional sense of the word. He doesn't belittle or denigrate Christianity, its tenets of faith and so on, but he distinguishes between what a historian is doing and what um, a theologian is doing, and, of course, between what a historian, a theologian, and the faithful are also doing. Faith is it has its own form of rationality. It's not that faithful people are irrational. For Ehrman, faith and rationality are historically constructed as well. They, they situate us all in our own time, place. Everything to do with our biography is linked up with how we believe, what we choose to believe. It's kind of like flat earthers or conspiracy theorists. They're not just irrational because they feel like it. They are deliberately uh, crafting a way of knowing and understanding the world based on the fractures in our own worldly practices, the, the linkages of power and knowledge and so on. They can smell that there's something not right in the way that, let's say, scientists uh, you know, uh, secular reason and so on works. We just have to look at the the way, you know, um, the materialist world keeps on wrecking the environment, um, regardless of what evidence or proof. You know, that's just as crazy as anything that we might attribute to somebody who believes in some sort of almighty God or believes in, you know, some sort of nature spirit under the tree, or believes that the earth is flat, or that, you know, there are lizard people under the earth, you know, or whatever it might be. There's historical reasons for everything, and really that's what Ehrman is on about. Now, why I chose this reading, why I kept it so short, is also uh, given the, I guess, the timing of where we, we are within the semester. Short reading is probably very much appreciated by you guys. But, you know, I kept it short because I wanted you to think about a whole bunch of things relating to the roots of our own society. We might be a secular Australian society, but we're still a Christian society. We're still shaped by Christian morality and Christian ethics. We still have a bunch of the patterns in our head that are Christian whether you're, you know, you you uh, choose to go to the footy on Sunday, or whether you choose to go to the church. So let's move on to to where we're going with this particular one. Okay, so first of all, actually, I'll flick back to this. This is an image of a close up, uh, out of focus, of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the Dead Sea Scrolls were found what in 1947 or something like that by a few Arab shepherd boys, you know, and but they really turned much of the world upside down in terms of its interpretation of Christianity and its relationship to early Judaic practices, you might say. Um, but I'm not here to talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls. We could run a whole course on the Dead Sea Scrolls. It would be fascinating. But I want to look at the power of application 
One of the things I think that's really key to this course is that we're looking at the conceptual nature of history. It's not at the practice of the historian, what happens in our heads, okay? But um, we can't do that fully without applying it to things. We need case studies. We need to look at what Richard Evans did and how he worked through the work of David Irving to illustrate its intellectual, ethical, possibly even moral failings. So with method and theory, the proof that I'm saying here in point one is in the practice. Does it work? Does it yield results? Are the results, and this is really important too, useful to you? There are methods that you might want to apply that actually don't help you at all. And the other question is, what do you lose when you apply a method? Okay, or a theory. Okay, we can't have a theory of everything, no matter how much we like to. So, you know, for me, I am not wedded personally to a theory. I think, oh, feminist theory will help me with this. Oh, Marxist theory will help me with this. Oh, um, realist theory will, will help me with this. Ah, post-structural theory will help you with this. I just jump around all over the place. It might mean that, you know, I'm uh, ungrounded, but really, no, I'm not. I'm really interested in ways in which we can understand our world from given positions. There are some positions that I am emotionally, ethically, whatever you might call it, intellectually committed to in, in, in much stronger ways. But when it comes to methods, I like things that help me see the world with new eyes, fresh eyes, and also help me understand something that's been puzzling me. I never get to the answer. I don't believe, and I've told you this, I don't believe in answers. I believe in a way of responding to reading the, the world around us, whether it's the past, the present, or the futures. So this is a really important that I, I want you to understand that it's the power of the application. If you're trying to work out, is history objective, like you had to do for your blog post? We asked for what? A historical example, didn't we? Why? Because the only way you can truly test if something, how objective something is, is through the application of objectivity as a principle. To say, hmm, how close can we get to a truth, for instance? Yeah. So this is really important. So then we can move on to this uh, question of, because it's really quite a relevant question to me, Ah, go back. Is how is that? What's the condition of our own historical and cultural database when it comes to the Bible? This is a an image of a page from the Gutenberg Bible. You know that very famous Bible, what fourteen fifty two Johannes Gutenberg in Gutenberg, of course. There was a printing press, and the first book he knocked out, of course, was the Gutenberg Bible. That's also a live link, yeah, to a an article in the Guardian where there was there was going to be some auction of a few pages or whatever of the of the Bible, and they were saying it's going to bring in half a million bucks or something like that. But I want to know how much you know about the Bible. You need to ask yourself that question. It's one of the foundational texts of our civilization, and it strikes me as astonishing that people don't know very much about the Bible today. Most people, unless they're churchgoers. Do you have a Bible at home? I think that's a really interesting question. I've got a few Bibles around here. Uh, I particularly, uh, it's because I'm bloody old and, and apostle, but I particularly, you know, like the, uh, the King James Version with all that beautiful 16th century English. I can't read the Bible as a, uh, what would we call it, as a person of faith. But aesthetically, culturally, I'm very much attuned to the Bible. When I want to chill out, I'll go and put on Gregorian chant. Um, and I, I get into a really nice space. You know, in, uh, there's much about Christian civilization that I enjoy as an aesthetic experience, um, cultural experience, in other words. I also have the same feeling for Indian culture. 
but it's not my culture in quite the same way. It's very deep in me, this my my appreciation of the Indian mythic world and, and so on, Ganesh and and you know, those sorts of Krishna and Shiva, uh Madalasa and people like that who were, you know, uh, um you know deeply significant signifiers. But you know, I have to say that I can't escape my own my generation because so i had to go to sunday school and all that sort of stuff but by the time i was a teenager i was te- i was doing the sunday school for my younger sisters it's quite funny really um yeah i i enjoy stories from the bible but i i do not see them as you know the word of god sorry if you're a christian you yeah. Um, but I do see them as supplying powerful ethical insights into human conditions. All right, doesn't matter where we are. Just the same as reading. I, I love reading Islamic stories, uh, particularly their teaching stories, the Sufi stories as well. Um, I've got uh, you know Confucius's Analects here. I've got many things because I'm a cultural, you know, crazy person who just rushes around. You're getting that idea now. But you know, uh, if we have to ask ourselves: Well, do we have a Bible? Do we under, do have we any um, understanding at all of where it came from? You know how it was put together, its history, as a document of faith and tradition, and so on. And you know, we can ask ourselves: Here we are in Australia, but how secular is Australia? We know that the previous Prime Minister Scott Morrison made a big deal about his faith, his Christianity. Tony Abbott's another good example. It's still important politically where you sit in the Christian, non-Christian, secular, materialist world. You know, it matters politically, and it matters even more politically in some countries than others, the US, for instance. Then we can say, well, who was Jesus? How did he die? You probably know that he, he ran afoul of the Romans, right? And they nailed him to a cross. That we know is an historical event. Why? Because it's attested to by multiple sources, not just Christian ones, by the way. What's his name? Pliny the Younger mentions it in in a letter to, uh, I think it's Trajan or whoever it was, I forget now, to one of the emperors and, you know, filling this emperor in on the background to some Christian, you know, uh, riots and so on in wherever he was the governor. Other question: What's the apocalypse? You know, it's has a huge psychological and cultural impact at different times in Western history. It's still got, uh, you could say, teeth in our own world, where you know, um, evangelical Christians still believe that the second coming is coming. That you know, the apocalypse is coming. You might say, "What's the second coming?" It's the return of the Son of Man, or some people would say Jesus, and you know, to uh, and the, and we all rise up out of our graves and sort of those of us who've been naughty. Down you go. Those who haven't, up you go. Yeah, that sort of thing. So that's the apocalypse. There's a great tradition of apoc- apocalyptic uh, apocalypticism. That's the word. Um, in in Judaism, predates the uh, birth of Jesus. Jesus himself if you believe Bart Ehrman's uh, reading of it, was an apocalyptic Jew. That means he was teaching, get ready, the apocalypse is coming and the second and the kingdom of God is coming down to earth and all the naughty people are going to get uh, tossed into the pits of fiery do- uh, hell, you know, or whatever. So it's really interesting. But these are the questions that I think as historians, historians of culture that we need to give serious thought to my last two questions there why do you think it is so hard to establish the accuracy of what jesus said and did and what is the root tension between text and oral tradition that of course is is um anticipating i think it's it was in the week 10 reading i should have gone and look shouldn't i uh, where we're looking at oral history and you know the way that orality plays out against text uh different ways of thinking and constructing stuff 
And of course, the Bible grew out of oral traditions. Nobody had written anything down. Jesus didn't write. Okay, his apostles, his followers were illiterate. They didn't speak Greek, and I don't think they spoke Latin. They spoke Aramaic or some form of early Aramaic. Um, so there were oral traditions around Jesus. These roll out over the years. St. Paul comes along, or Paul of Tarsus, and, you know, he has this major experience, spiritual experience, which he tells us about in the New Testament. He didn't write any of the Gospels. The names given to the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are names attributed to the Gospels. They weren't written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because, well, John was probably, he was a, uh, uh, I think, an assistant to Paul or something like that. Um, John might have been literate, but certainly he didn't write that text. Why? We know that. Because um, that text, no, it was Luke who was the assistant to, um, to, I've got to get my biblical memory kicking back in. I wasn't, I'm not really intending to give a, a lecture on, on biblical studies. But, you know, it, it was Luke who, who accompanied uh, Paul as he evangelized Christianity. He, he, more than anybody, created the basic premises and principles of Christianity more than Jesus did. Because uh, Jesus was talking in a very specific cultural context. Jesus taught through parables. Why? Because he he was speaking and working in an oral tradition. You've got to think about this stuff. Now, what did Ammon, what does Ammon have to do with all of this? Well, he he makes a very clear distinction between history as a discipline. He says history is not theology. And I just said it's also not uh, uh, the work of looking at the Bible as, as a, a person of deep faith. You're going to see the Bible quite differently to the way an historian does. So history is interested in what happened. It is also interested in why it happened. What happened with Jesus? Why did he say these things? And so on. Why was he killed by the Romans? Why did, you know, why was his message, at least this much of the message, that much of St. Paul, <laughs> why it, was it so successful? How did it have to change over the centuries in order to um, succeed? and ultimately become the faith of the Roman Empire in, what was it, uh, 312 or 13, or whenever it was, that Constantine converted the, the Roman Emperor. History has uses, as we discovered from week seven. You know, some of it, I've often seen history used to justify Christian ascendancy in the West. But it's also uh, used in explaining that ascendancy. Why, why was Christianity so, why did it, beat all these other competing uh, forms of the kind of Christianity we have. There's only one form. You know, if you, it, you, you might have heard of the Coptic Christians. You know, they are a very early form uh, of Christianity that didn't change and didn't accept the uh, form of Christianity that ultimately came to dominate the West. Then we got the schism was it 1050 or something, between the papacy and the... Um, and ...historical changes. Historians want to explain this, okay? They want to say, okay, these changes happened for these reasons, okay? But we can't just explain them out of context, and that's really important. Early histories, of course, do exist. There's good old Eusebius, who was writing in what the first part of the fourth century. Uh, he wrote the first history of Christianity that we have, at least. Uh, a few centuries later comes this English monk who is an absolutely brilliant, brilliant man called Bede, <laughs> B-E-D-E, Bede, who uh, wrote his history of the English-speaking people. Was it something like I forget what it was? Uh, no. Winston Churchill wrote History of the English-Speaking People, but Bede wrote a history of, you know, Christianity in England up until the, his day, which was like the 730s, 740s of the Common Era. But as Erwin shows, these guys weren't alone. There were classical historians too, who often did a better job of doing their history than the, um, uh, than the Christian historians. There was Livy and Suetonius, for instance, so there were, there were others out there working. Okay. 
So if we want to look for the historical Jesus, and this is the question that Ellen asks, and this is why I've included this in the uh, in our History 300 course, is that we want to peel away 20 centuries. Do you think of 20 centuries of story? Biblical historians want to know what happened. Who was Jesus? How does he relate to his own time? How the, did his story change over the centuries? Patterns of divinity in the ancient world. We're going to touch upon that. It's the only quote I've actually got in this um, entire little uh, thought bubble. You know, we've got the the uh, Greco-Roman god Dionysus, okay, or Dionysus, however you want to say it, Dionysus, um, who, you know, dies and resurrects people uh, who worshipped him and were baptised. They were... They ate his body and drank it, you know, the, this body, my, and eat it in memory, my blood, drink it in memory of me. They did all of those sorts of stuff. Dionysus. Apollonius, guy who lived about 50 years after Jesus. Very interesting story. I'm going to refer to him a little bit more. There's, of course, Jesus. So there were models. How to make sense of the distant past and the stories, histories found in the Bible? This is a really interesting question. It's a question that I've been fascinated by for years. So that's cover of the, the book, one that I was waving around just in case you want to go and get it. But, you know, I want to talk about methodological criteria because that's really what is of interest to a course like this. How do we work out what represents the true historical Jesus in his own time that's come through the oral traditions into the books that we have in the New Testament. Okay. Herman, if you've done the reading, um, says, look, we've got independent attestation, we've got dissimilarity, and we've got contextual credibility, and he calls these criteria. What is independent attestation? Well, quite simply, is that there are a number of the books of the New Testament, go back to a book which we don't have anymore, a book that some Germans uh, <laughs> a long time ago worked this out, called a Q, which stands for something in German uh, for, uh, you know, the, the root or the primary document that both uh, two of the Gospels <clears throat> rely upon, as does a, a, a number of what are called apocryphal Gospels, that's the ones that didn't make it into the Bible, but, have a, you know, we now have versions of because of the Dead Sea Scrolls and so on. Gospel of Thomas, and, and for instance, is, a, is one that's Gospel of Peter is another one. Independent attestation means two or three or four people independent of one another, not relying on the same sources, seem to be totally separated, and either historically, temporally, or ge geographically or whatever, but don't know that these other guys exist. And they're writing down what they know about in this case, Jesus. Okay, that's independent attestation, but it doesn't guarantee that what they're writing down is going to be true. But what Erwin says is, look, if two of them write down that Jesus said this in what's called the Beatitudes, or Jesus said this, or he raised that person from the dead, or he made he walked on the water, if this is independently attested to in a number of texts that don't know of one another's existence, it's more likely to have happened, just more likely. Ehrman says there's no, no guarantees here. This dissimilarity is a really interesting one. There, he, he points out, and he goes to great length in the book, to illustrate how there are sayings that, uh, that Jesus is said to have said that actually disagree or fly in the face of the way Christians, early Christians after Jesus, were starting to understand his mission. He was the son of God, but at different times he talks about the son of God, Jesus does, in ways that in indicate that he's thinking the son of God is somebody else. Mm. That flies in the face of early Christian theological thinking about what Jesus was. So if Jesus is, is says things that actually doesn't serve the purposes of people writing these later Gospels and Paul writing his letters and so on, that's a dissimilarity. Again, it doesn't guarantee that this is what Jesus said. Okay, what about contextual credibility? Well, that's an interesting one. That's, I was kind of doing that when I was talking about Dionysus and Apollonius. You know, there were 
contextual credibility is, does what Jesus is said to have said make sense within the context of the early first century Judaism as we know of it today? So if Jesus says something and that that doesn't sound, hey, if that sounds like something someone from the second century might have said, okay, then it's more likely that somebody in the second century has put those words into Jesus' mouth to prove a point. There was no sense of either plagiarism or there was no sense of the ethics of uh, writing history the way we would write history. These people wrote to explain something. They wrote not to, um, what's the word, not to capture the realities, but it's a bit like that Herodotus that I was talking about a few weeks ago, to provide a moral lens or moral compass for something, okay? They wrote with that intention. They, so the, the lives of Jesus, they have him born in different places, not different places, but they have him, some don't even talk about his birth, some have him, um, what do you call it, crucified before the Passover. Others have him crucified on the Passover so that he, it's the Jesus Easter story and so on. So there, there are all, all sorts of irregularities because they weren't really writing history. They were writing narratives of Jesus' life to demonstrate or illustrate certain, what's the word, uh, certain assumptions about uh, the world that they were seeing through an emerging Christian lens. So in, in you know, there are different themes in the Gospels. It's really interesting. I think I'm not sure if it's in this book or in another book by Ehrman. He talks about using literary scholarship to understand aspects of these four um, Gospels. They were written, you know, uh, somewhere between 65 years after Jesus' birth, 65 CE or AD, uh, the, the oldest, the, the youngest one is the Gospel of John, and that was written around 95 AD of the Common Era. Okay, so there's a lot of time for things to move. Some of them were written just before the major Jewish rebellion against the Romans that led ultimately to the destruction of the temple and the dissemination of the Jews all around the world. Um, John was written after that event. That means that we have uh, John reflecting on the world in a very different way to beforehand. So this contextual credibility is really important. This guy here looks like Socrates or someone, doesn't he? He's actually, this is a sculpture of uh, Apollonius of Tiana. And actually, if you, go, if you click on the thing, you'll see that it takes you to a text uh, of his life by one of his um, followers a couple of centuries or a century or so after Apollonius had died. But the interesting thing is for Ehrman is that he says, look, it was only after his death, meaning Jesus' death, that the man Jesus came to be thought of as God on earth. This is a historical question, he says. How did death happen? The place that started with an understanding of how other humans like Apollonius came to be considered divine in the ancient world. It was, I mean, for a start, we had Roman emperors, all of whom were considered to become divine. And Roman emperors, when you got a new emperor, they immediately appeared, statues of them all over the Roman Empire, and that, you know, needed to be worshipped, and so on. But there were plenty of examples, and he gives, uh, Ehrman gives you know, many examples in, in that book, on others like Apollonius. He was born of a virgin mother. He, the, there was this kind of light star. It wasn't a star star. It, was, uh, it wasn't a comet comet. It was some sort of star thing that was above his where he was born. His mother was told before the birth or maybe even before conception that she was going to give birth to this God man type thing. Um, he went and did miracles. He did all the sorts of things that Jesus did. But Apollonius was a Pythagorean. Uh, in, in other words, he was a follower of the cult that Pythagoras started five centuries earlier. So it's really, really interesting. So this is an example of conditional credibility. Okay, so the Christians after Jesus died, 
you know, did that, they came up with the resurrection. They came up with, you know, um, the meeting uh, of Jesus after the um, after his death with the apostles. They came up with all these things, but there were templates for all of those. The Dionysian cult is the same, you know. The Last Supper is almost a textbook, you know, copy of the Dionysian Last Supper. Now, I'm not meaning to make you, you Christians, if you're if there's a Christian listening to this, depressed. I'm just saying that there are historical truths. But I think, and I would argue very strongly, as you know, Francesco Riccardi does, that there are emotions of truth. That truth isn't just doesn't have to be one thing. Um, the truth of faith is to me a very, very important and profound thing. Um, yeah, it's it's something that you can't describe. It's an emotional faith relationship with realities. The spiritual reality is something that historians often tiptoe around. But in actual fact, you know, for me, it's something that whether it's just a good piece of poetry or an amazing piece of music or a piece of art and stuff behind me, whatever it is, okay, there are different ways of understanding human longing, human yearning, and contextualizing. One of the most profound ways is the religious. What do we believe? It's might, and it's often important to believe things that don't make sense in a rational materialist world. Yeah. So here we have one of my favourite pieces of work. Um, it's the baptism of Jesus. Okay, now, in that little reading that you've got, Ehrman talks about the baptism of Jesus as one of the things that would represent the criteria of dissimilarity. This is the last image, by the way, the last part for this talk. Um, so... Jesus get, feels that he needs to be baptised by John the Baptist. You would normally go and get baptised by somebody superior to you. Why would early Christians who were trying to show that Jesus was special, the son of God and so on, God on earth, why would he go and get baptised by the Baptist? Well, there's a historical reason for that. John the Baptist was a, an apocalyptic Jewish preacher. Guess what? So was Jesus, according to Bart Ehrman. Okay? So he went, to, he went and got baptised by John in order to demonstrate his um, affinity with or his alignment with the teachings of John. Later on, they bring in the dove coming down and you know the voice of God coming up. If you if you know the John Wayne movie or whatever it was, that one from you know greatest story ever told, that was what it was called. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased, or whatever it was, which is straight out of the Bible. Um, you know that appears later in the story. At first, Jesus just gets baptized. All right. So the for me, this is all about method. How do we approach truth? Well, we have to approach historical truth through methods that help us ascertain the validity or non-validity of, you know, um, historical texts. Ehrman's got, you know, I, I, I really respect this guy's work. I think it's fascinating. It's thorough. It's scholarly. It's diligent. Okay. doesn't shake my faith, whatever that faith is, um, I still think I, I look at that piece of work and I just think Piero della Francesca, you rock. Okay. Great Italian Renaissance painter, incredible scene, but also something extremely special about humanity's relationship with things that you can't really put your finger on. So I want you to think about that. But I also really want you to think about method, and particularly this kind of method where we're dealing with a text like the Bible which is considered by many sacred, uh, has had a long evolutionary history and, and grows out of oral tradition because that's where we're ending up in a, a week or two from now. Um, I wish I'd gone and checked that beforehand, but you can. You can go and look at the readings uh, for the next couple of weeks. I hope you found uh, this short talk useful. Remember, theory and practice go together. You can theorize as much as you like. If you're not applying it, not testing it, and so on, you're just going up the creek and you're going to get lost. And no one's going to pay any attention to your work. So thank you very much. We'll stop there.
All right, stop share and stop recall. Take care of yourself and I'll see some of you in class, I hope, quite soon. Bye.